Good morning, everyone. You all wake up okay? Not freeze completely as you walked out your door this morning? Well, the good news is that it'll be 60 later in the week, right? Uh, just a couple of announcements before we begin Mass. Uh, Lexi Davina is available in the back, also available online. After the 10.30 Mass this morning, if you'd like to join in, so you're invited to come back. Uh, confessions will be tomorrow over at the Parish Center, 6.30 uh, to... Uh, 6.30 to 7.30, don't worry, the brain's turning on, coffee's beginning to take hold. Uh, so if you uh, want to go for Lenten Confessions, those will be tomorrow, 6.30 to 7.30. Stations of the Cross will be Friday at 7. Uh, the Knights of Columbus are having uh, another fish dinner coming up on the 19th. So as you've signed up for the ones already, I invite you to sign up for the other ones. And then finally, as you noticed this morning, we've adjusted the seating a little bit, and there's a very particular reason for that. Last week at the 10.30, we had 81 people. That's a good thing. There's more people coming back. However, you had half of the church over-distanced as they were in the front when we set everything up back in May, and then you had the back half of the church particularly not as well-distanced. So this was the only way to be able to kind of make an adjustment to make sure that we're fitting everybody in and still keeping that safe distance as best we can. So that's why it's a little adjustment here and everything else. Mind you, this is the only adjustment we can make going forward up until the restrictions are completely lifted. So you'll not see any other changes aside from this one. But again, did clear it with the diocese, did check in, did the uh, checked in on all the other places that are already doing it this way, everything else. So everything checks out. Not to mention we finally, on our cases, dropped into the green. So we're in a good spot now going forward to be able to make a run at this. So. Uh, that'll be how it's uh, set up for the time being until we uh, pray God, get to the other side of the pandemic, which looking like we're tracking towards anyway, and we'll go from there. All right, my friends, thank you very much, and we'll start Mass in just a moment. stand for our opening hymn. everyone. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And spirit. My brothers and sisters, as we continue our Lenten journey, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask, Blessed Mary of a Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ have, mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. 
O God, author of every mercy and of all goodness, who in fasting, prayer, and almsgiving have shown us a remedy for sin, look graciously on this confession of our lowliness, that we who are bowed down by our conscience may always be lifted up by your mercy. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Exodus. In those days, God delivered all these commandments. I, the Lord, am your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. You shall not have other gods besides me. You shall not carve idols for yourselves in the shape of anything in the sky above, or in the earth below, or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down before them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, inflicting punishment for their father's wickedness on the children of those who hate me down to the third and fourth generation, but bestowing mercy down to the thousandth generation on the children of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain, for the Lord will not leave unpunished the one who takes his name in vain. Remember to keep holy the Sabbath day. Six days you may labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. No work may be done then, either by you or your son or daughter, or your male or female slave, or your beast, or the alien who lives with you. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them. But on the seventh day he rested, that is why the Lord has blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, that you may have a long life in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife nor his male or female slave, nor his ox or ass, or anything else that belongs to him. The word of the Lord. of the Lord are right, rejoicing in the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. Lord, you have the words of everlasting life. The fear of the Lord is pure. So then 
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Since the Passover of the Jews was near, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple area those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, as well as the money changers seated there. He made a whip out of cords and drove them all out of the temple area with the sheep and oxen spilled the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold doves, he said, Take these out of here and stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples recalled the words of scripture, Zeal for your house will consume me. At this the Jews answered and said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they came to believe the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. While he was in Jerusalem for the feast of Passover, Many began to believe in his name, and when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus would not trust himself to them, because he knew them all, and did not need anyone to testify about human nature. He himself understood it well. The Gospel of the Lord. Every time this gospel pops up, there's a meme that goes around the internet, and it's usually the depiction of Jesus with the cords walking into the temple and saying, if someone asks, what would Jesus do? Tell them that whipping a cord at people and overturning tables is an option. Oh, 
nobody's awake for that. Nobody's had enough coffee yet. It's okay. I understand. Yes, my brain's barely rolling right now. But when we hear this response of Jesus this morning in the Gospels, we see him make this response, and we're all a little shocked because we're going, is this the Prince of Peace? This doesn't really seem to fit. But when we look at our Lord's life and what he bring, brings to the proverbial table, if you will, remember Jesus is never out of control. He's never outside of his own emotions. He's always making a just response. And turning the temple, the place of God's presence, into a marketplace, or rather profaning it, rises to a certain level that had eluded those who were again accustomed to go into the temple for worship on a regular basis. So Jesus steps in and, well, he lets them know, this is not okay, everyone. This is not what we're going to do today. And he again cleanses the temple and makes everything come together. Now, don't raise your hand for this, please. This is a rhetorical question. But have you ever been admonished by our Lord? Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever had him kind of firmly but gently have to say to you, uh, this is not working. You're not doing my will. You're not doing what I've called you towards. Because that every now and then happens. It's not, again, a crushing in upon ourselves that's meant to destroy us, but it's a firmness but gentleness of saying, I've made you for something else. I need you to turn towards me and what I'm asking you to do. That can be difficult. But God has made us for himself, as St. Augustine says, and our hearts will be restless until they rest in him. We have to make our way towards the Lord, and sometimes if we're ignoring him, he's going to find a way to get our attention, that we can again resume the path that he has designed for our life. Because remember, when we're looking at the world, the enemy has one weapon that he primarily uses, and it's his greatest weapon. Now, some people are going to be sitting there and all of a sudden thinking like, oh no, Father's going to talk about possession or exorcism this morning. No, no, no. He's got even a more deadly weapon than that because it's the weapon that breaks us out of our relationship with God. That weapon, of course, is temptation. It's the ordinary use of what he do the enemy does to us each and every day. He tries to tempt us to trust in anything else but God. To get our mind's eye on something else, maybe even a good, that is not him. And to take us away from the path of where we need to be. Think of it. What's usually the temptation if we can categorize it? It's either in wealth, money becomes a primary concern. It's in power, needing to control something. It's in pleasure all the little simple things of life, or it's an honor. I don't, want to be, I don't want to be cast down. I want to be raised up and liked by everybody. Those four categories are really encompass almost every temptation that the enemy is going to throw at us. But the problem is, is that they are all not going to be enough. Because for every person we see in life that has the fullness of those attributes, it's never enough. It's not filling them up, and the solution at that point is either to A, reevaluate, or B, push in deeper and go further. That's why no amount of money will ever be enough. That's why no amount of pleasure will ever satisfy. It's why no amount of honor will ever be enough to make us feel secure. And again, it's why we look at all of these things of the world and it's, again, can't satisfy the deepest longings of our human heart. It's going to be the Lord himself that is going to do this. But we have to make an active ascent of our will to turn away from the temptation and to seek him out. There is no other pathway to holiness. And we heard it in the opening prayer, didn't we? That in this season of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving, God gives us the weapons against sin to turn away from these temptations, to turn away from those things that are pulling us away from his love, grace, and mercy. But we have to make an ascent of that will, a yes, if you will, constantly 
and not fall into the trap of getting complacent and thinking, well, I've done enough. Until the moment comes when we have reached the end of our lives, the temptation to, again, fall into complacency or all of the other things we mentioned will not stop. There will always be another angle that the enemy is going to play, and God will always be reaching out to us, offering us another piece to help us to grow in our relationship with him until it's time to meet him face to face. That is our life until we get to heaven or we, again, we make a definitive turning away from God. See, the lights flickered right when I said heaven. That means God wants you to take that step and go closer to him, right? There we go. Thanks, Lord, for the assist. So, with all of that in mind, how do we make that decision? How will we even be able to get, begin to do that? Well, I leave you with this. There's a movie that came out in the late 90s called The Truman Show. Anybody know it? Some of you shaking your heads. Some of you haven't had enough coffee yet, and I, I empathize. The Truman Show is almost, if you look at it, there's some allegories to the Christian life in there. And you have this producer who's almost playing this figure of the enemy called Christoph, or Christ off. Pretty convenient, actually. And what he's doing is he's trying to keep the main character there, Truman, locked in this little, again, world that he's created for him. And you have these other people who are trying to kind of get him out to the real world that he can live that life of reality, if you will. It gets to the point where at the, at, towards the end of the film, when they're go having this back and forth, the people on the outside with the producer, there's a line where it says, again, who are you to stop him from going out to live that life of reality? And the producer, Christoph, says, he can leave whenever he wants. If he was absolutely intent on walking out that door, there is nothing we could do to stop him. He, but he would have to be absolutely intent on doing so. For our Christian life, dear friends, are we absolutely intent on living a life for God? Is it our primary objective? It is, have we made it our priority in this life to seek his will over everything else? Because until we do that, we will not be able to overcome the constant temptations of falling into the same traps. We have to make a deliberate decision, taking up those, those weapons, if you will, of prayer, fasting, and almsgiving to allow ourselves to see it through and to make our way towards that exit door from all the chaos and the craziness and to follow our Lord's will. That's the path question we face is will we give our yes so dear friends let us pray for that gift of grace we need this morning and ask our lord to turn our hearts that we may give our yes and follow him wherever he may lead Let us stand now and profess our faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Trusting in our Lord and Savior, we bring our prayers before him this day. We pray for our Holy Father, the bishops, clergy, religious, and lay faithful, that by the, their witness to the power of the gospel, many may come to know and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray to the Lord. We pray for all world leaders and lawmakers. May they act wisely and compassionately, always working for justice on behalf of the most vulnerable members of our society. We pray to the Lord. We pray for our parents, grandparents, teachers, and all role models, that they, may, that they will lead by example and word and action, reflecting the wisdom of God and not that of the world. We pray to the Lord. We pray for the sick, the hungry, the homeless, the unemployed, and those who mourn. May they experience the tender and loving compassion of Christ. We pray to the Lord. For our mission parish in Haiti, we pray to the Lord. For all first responders in our military and frontline medical people and support staff, that they may be all kept safe and healthy in the midst of this pandemic, we pray to the Lord. For those friends and loved ones who have gone on before us into the embrace of the Lord's arms, and especially for Paul Gagnon, who we, remember, who we will remember in this liturgy, we pray to the Lord. For all the intentions of our parish prayer chain, and for all those who you hold in the, your own hearts, all those prayers you hold, rather, in your own hearts, that are known to God alone. We pray to the Lord. Merciful Savior, we lift our hearts before you this day, asking for your abundant grace and mercy. Strengthen us on our journeys, and help our yes to lead us towards your holy will in all things. And we ask this through Christ our Lord.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Be pleased, O Lord, with these sacrificial offerings, and grant that we who beseech pardon for our own sins may take care to forgive our neighbor. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for you have given your children a sacred time for the renewing and purifying of their hearts, that freed from disordered affections, they may so deal with the things of this passing world as to hold fast, rather, to the things that eternally endure. And so with all the angels and saints we praise you, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and from the world's beginning are ceaselessly at work, so that the human race may become holy, just as you yourself are holy. Look, we pray, upon your people's offerings, and pour out on them the power of your Spirit, that they may become the body and blood of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we too are your sons and daughters. Indeed, though we were once lost, and could not approach you. You loved us with the greatest love, for your Son, who alone is just, handed himself over to death, and did not disdain to be nailed for our sake to the wood of the cross. But before his arms were outstretched between heaven and earth, to become the lasting sign of your covenant, he desired to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. As he ate with them, he took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, knowing that he was about to reconcile all things in himself through his blood to be shed on the cross, he took the chalice filled with the fruit of the vine, and once more giving you thanks, handed the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Passover and our surest peace, we celebrate his death and resurrection from the dead, and looking forward to his blessed coming, we offer you, who are our faithful and merciful God, this sacrificial victim, 
who reconciles to you the human race. Look kindly, most compassionate Father, on those you unite to yourself by the sacrifice of your Son, and grant that, by the power of the Holy Spirit, as they partake of this one bread and one chalice, they may be gathered into one body in Christ, who heals every division. Be pleased to keep us always in communion of mind and heart, together with Francis our Pope and Robert our Bishop. Help us to work together for the coming of your kingdom until the hour when we stand before you, saints among saints in the halls of heaven, with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints, and with our deceased brothers and sisters, whom we humbly commend to your mercy, then freed at last from the wound of corruption, and made fully into a new creation, we shall sing to you with gladness the thanksgiving of Christ, who lives for all eternity. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as you await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will. To live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer to one another a sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed.
now pray the prayer of spiritual communion. <coughs> My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray. As we receive the pledge of things yet hidden in heaven, and are nourished while still on earth, with the bread that comes from on high, we humbly entreat you, O Lord, that what is being brought about in us in mystery may come to true completion, through Christ our Lord. Amen. We now pray the prayer of St. Michael. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. Direct, O Lord, we pray, the hearts of your faithful, and in your kindness grant your servants this grace, that abiding in love of you and their neighbor, they may fulfill the whole of your commands. Through Christ our Lord. And may Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Have a great week, everyone.